Welcome everyone. Andrew and I are here for this fifth and final session of our Lenten series based upon the grace of Le Miserable. Uh, now it's appropriate that uh, this series comes to an end because we are running out of materials and characters. Uh, but also it is time uh, for the closing of Lent, uh, for Palm Sunday, for moving on to Holy Week, and what for us will be a very different Easter this year. Uh, today we will address the building of the barricade and the story of Les Amis, which translate the friends. Uh, I would like to thank Andrew, Jane, and, uh, Anna Miller, Bill Thurston, Daniel Ingram, Cassandra Duca, uh, and everyone else who has participated in and supported this effort. Uh, and that includes uh, everyone, all of you who have uh, attended and viewed uh, these sessions. Uh, it has been our uh, joy to, to join in this journey with you. Now, our key scripture from, for this session comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what, re re what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. We know from session one of the series that Paris during this period was no stranger to uprisings. The uprising of 1832, which is depicted here in our story, uh, is one more. Uh, we have previously discussed that the underlying uh, problems uh, for the uprising of 1832 were poverty, oppression, and specifically cholera. Uh, the trigger for the uprising was presented by the death of General uh, Lamarck. Now, General Lamarck had been a hero of under Napoleon, uh, and he'd been a supporter of Republican causes. His funeral procession was joined uh, by a throng uh, through Paris, which included among that throng the Friends of the ABC, which translates Les Amis de ABC. Uh, and ABC in French uh, is a play on words because it also um, is very similar to the word the oppressed. Uh, student Friends of Marius, the character we met last week, um, who he had come. Uh, to know those friends uh, joined in the procession uh, and they were armed when they did so. France had prepared itself for trouble. Present in and around Paris were 26,000 troops. Uh, these consisted of National Guard, Municipal Guard, and some troops of the line, meaning professional soldiers. A skirmish between National Guard troops and the friends, as I will refer to them, resulted in the building of the barricades and what happened after. Our passage from Matthew says, love your enemies. But were there really enemies here? Louis Philippe was the monarch at the time, and he was uh, not of the Bourbon line. He was of a New Orleans line. He was uh, on the throne, but much more in the model of the British monarch. Uh, more of a constitutional monarchy, uh, and generally uh, was, was liked by the masses. Uh, the friends and the troops came from the same French society, uh, basically the same background, and, and really did not hate one another either until the killing began and the troops became angry uh, at the friends. The friends acted on the somewhat vague notion that a Republican government would make things better for the people. Now, Matt Rawls suggests that the Friends, as individuals, came to the barricades for different reasons, perhaps unclear reasons. But I suspect this is always the case uh, for individuals when they go to war. Uh, 
Marius, who again we met last week, joined his friends at the barricades because he believed Cosette had left with Jean Valjean for England and that he had nothing left to live for. But when the fighting began, Marius displayed both courage and leadership. What is significant here is that having once arrived, almost no one left the barricade. Uh, five individuals were compelled to leave by the group. Uh, they were spared because of family obligations. Um, for a time, the friends had kept a back door through which they could have all escaped. Uh, eventually, uh, that exit was cut off and closed. The success of the uprising was dependent upon the citizenry of Paris rising up uh, to join the friends, and it eventually became clear that doors and windows surrounding the barricade would remain closed and locked, while in other parts of the city, the bourgeois still went out for dinner in the theater. The friends were on their own. The ultimate outcome, therefore, was never in doubt. Everyone behind the barricade was killed except for Javert, Marius, and Jean Valjean. Was the sacrifice of life worth it? Dan Bagby spoke about Victor Hugo in last Sunday's uh, wonderful sermon. We must remember that Hugo was a romantic writer. He appears to find nobility in the deaths uh, which occur during an uprising or insurrection. Listen also to the prediction made by Hugo through his character Jolas. Uh, the primary leader of the Friends, and I'm going to now pick up uh, the novel itself and read you a brief passage. Again, the words of Victor Hugo, written through, uh, spoken through one of his uh, one of his primary characters, citizens, uh, citizens being a term uh, of the Republic. The 19th century is great, but the 20th century will be happy then there will be nothing more like the old history. Men will no longer have to fear, as they do now, a conquest, conquest, an invasion, a usurpation, a rivalry of nations with the armed hand, an interruption of civilization depending on a marriage of kings, a birth in the hereditary tyrannies, a partition of the peoples by a congress, a dismembering through the downfall of a dynasty, a combat of two religions meeting head on, like the two goats of darkness, on the bridge of infinity, infinity rather, they will no longer have to fear famine, exploitation, prostitution from distress, misery from lack of work, and the scaffold, and the sword, and the battle, and all the highway robberies of chance in the forest of events. We might also say, uh, there will be no more enemies. Men will be happy. The human race will fulfill its law as the terrestrial globe fulfills its own. Harmony will be reestablished between the soul and the star. The soul will gravitate about the truth like the star about the light. Friends, this hour we are living in and in which I am speaking to you is a somber one, but such is the terrible price of the future. A revolution is a toll gate. Obviously, Hugo mostly missed the mark here. In, just in the first half of the 20th century alone, France saw World Wars I and II, uh, much of which were fought on French soil, the Nazi occupation, and the Holocaust. Uh, as the 20th century moved on, perhaps, there was some hope brought by the UN and NATO, which had resulted in 70 years of European peace. But there was a lot of bloodshed before uh, those goals were, uh, that goal of peace was reached. I would like to return now to the character of Jean Valjean and the role he played at the barricade and in its immediate aftermath. First, Jean Valjean appears at the barricade. Why? And why is because Marius was there. Jean Valjean wanted to hate Marius because Marius was a threat. He and Cosette loved one another. There was the risk that uh, 
Marius would take Cosette away. Cosette was the only person that Jean Valjean had ever loved. So again, Jean Valjean finds himself conflicted. He wants to hate Marius, and yet he is drawn to the scene of the barricade where Marius is at risk uh, and where Jean Valjean uh, wants to protect him. What role does Jean Valjean play? The role of saving lives and I would add, of providing grace. Jean Valjean has been really a shapeshifter throughout our story of Lumez. He changes names and identities. He's a person of great strength, intelligence, resourcefulness, and ingenuity. He always manages to escape from impossibly difficult situations. Let's return to our definitions of grace from the first week of our series. Ephesians describes grace as, as follows. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Then our other definitions uh, include one from Wikipedia uh, regarding grace in Christianity. Grace is a gift from the Heavenly Father given through His Son, Jesus Christ. So grace comes from God. It comes through Jesus Christ. And I would suggest that Jean Valjean has, at this stage of our story, taken on a Christ-like role. Some examples from the novel are as follows. First of all, behind the barricade, uh, he takes no offensive act. Uh, when he fires a gun, first it's an instance where uh, there is a need to reinforce the barricade. Uh, the French troops are preparing to fire cannon filled with grape shot uh, at the friends. Uh, and there, so as protection for, and, and grape shot, think of nine pounds of, of grape shot being fired at a time by a cannon. It's like a huge shotgun. Uh, and it's, it's going to spread out and kill many people. Well, there was a mattress. Uh, that someone had hung as protection outside of their window, up stories above the barricade. Uh, it was hanging by two ropes. Jean Valjean was reputed uh, in the story to be a great shot. It, in the very beginning of the story, he had helped provide for his family uh, as a poacher, as a hunter. Uh, and uh, so he took a double-barreled uh, carbine and he shot first one of the ropes holding the mattress and then the other. Two shots, two ropes hit, the mattress falls, it's used, uh, placed behind the barricade and it saves lives. Next there are, uh, next Jean Valjean volunteers to assassinate Javert. When the, the end is near, the French troops are about to assault and, uh, and, and Enjolras has decided that, that uh, it is time for Javert to go. Uh, but Jean Valjean volunteers to commit this killing only so that he can release uh, Javert, which he does. Uh, also, there are, uh, there's a rooftop, rooftop observer. A French soldier goes to the top of a roof, a roof into a position where he can look behind the barricade and see where uh, the defenders are stationed so that he can signal that back to the troops. Well, Jean Valjean again takes a rifle and he shoots the hat off of, uh, off of the observer. Uh, that observer scampers down out of sight. He's replaced by a sergeant. Jean Valjean again takes up a rifle and shoots off the hat of the sergeant. Uh, the sergeant scampers down and nobody returns to that position, but Jean Valjean hurts no one in the process. What he's doing again is saving lives, not taking them. But what's really, I think, significant is when Marius falls in battle. He suffered numerous small wounds. Finally, he uh, receives a wound that is causing him to black out and fall at the barricade when suddenly strong hands reach out and grab him and carry him away. Uh, Jean Valjean with Marius is briefly uh, in a protected position and once again Jean Valjean's resourcefulness, sorry about that, uh, 
once again Jean Valjean's resourcefulness is called upon and he sees a grate dislodged in the ground and he moves the grate and with Marius is able to drop down into what turn out to be the sewers of Paris. Now the Parisian sewers are uh, infamous uh, they have not changed really in centuries at the time of the story. Uh, it is like dropping into a tomb of darkness and, and filth. Um, but there Jean Valjean uh, escapes with Marius and Hugo describes Jean Valjean as carrying Marius like a cross. And with Marius on his back he labors through uh, through the labyrinth of the sewers until finally uh, he reaches uh, light uh, where there's a, an exit out beside the Seine. Uh, and what follows then, with the help of Javert, I might add, is a rescue and a return to life for Marius. So as we approach Holy Week, uh, I ask, is this not the Christ story, carried out now by Jean Valjean, but for the benefit of Marius, so that Marius can recover, so that Marius and, and Cosette can marry and go forward, as we were saying last week, uh, to carry forward into the future uh, their love and hope. All right, so, Andrew. Um, Matt Rawl and his materials offer us on parallel tracks the building of the barricades by uh, Les Amis or the Friends and then the tragic uprising that followed with the interest, entry of uh, Jesus into Jerusalem and the events of Holy Week. We've learned that the Friends sought a republic as a better solution to oppression and poverty and as we've learned to the cholera epidemic which had been ravaging France and Paris specifically. In short, the Friends wished to overthrow the monarchy of Louis Philippe in favor of a Republican government. Now, focusing on the events of Holy Week, what did Jesus int intend with his entry into Jerusalem? All right. Well, um, I've been, Dad described it as a soliloquy. My favorite part of this soliloquy is that Valjean is depicted as a Christ-like figure in his use of a shotgun, which I think as a, uh, <laughs> as a hunter, I just thought that would, the, the, the redemption and Christ-likeness of the... Um, it's only appropriate with a yeah. shotgun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that was... That if was, only it had involved a bird dog. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Or venison, uh, as some of you uh, have participated in over the years. So, um, yeah. Uh, the comparison of, of Jesus's context with the context of the story, I, and I, I think it's always important um, to connect it with uh, our context as well. So um, I think it, it, it's it's interesting to consider uh, Paris in the context of a cholera outbreak and our reality here in the context of the pandemic that we're um, grappling with in this city uh, and across the country and across the globe um, uh, and the the sense of uh, a weight that is uh, on us as we're um, forced through executive order to distance and uh, to physically isolate uh, I had an example I heard this morning of a church uh, who has a food distribution and someone was on their way to the food distribution and was stopped um, at a checkpoint and, and ask where are you going um, and so uh, for those of us um, I'll speak for myself who have not personally experienced legal legally based oppression uh, this 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 experience just gives us a taste I think of some of the weight that say uh, legally based segregation in this country would have forced on people who were legally required to use different facilities and that kind of thing. So I think first context of the story, context of the scripture, and our context, it's important to get a sense of how those all uh, play together. And, and then I'll say 
uh, in understanding scripture, we have to understand that. In understanding the text, we always have to understand the context of scripture. It's essential to understanding the story. So, uh, what we have to understand about Jesus' day, uh, the, the world of Jerusalem and Judea, uh, that Roman presence and Roman oppression was a constant factor in life. That this was the context in which um, Jesus lived and in which Jesus' first hearers would have considered the story of um, uh, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It's all in the context of Rome. And so um, I think the, the, the parallel of 26,000 soldiers in Paris and the sense that there were Roman soldiers all around Jerusalem, it's Holy Week, it's, it's, the, it's Holy Week for us, it's Passover. Um, everyone is, is streaming into Jerusalem, and it's a time when there was often uprising in Jerusalem because people are full of religious verve. Uh, they, 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 there's messianic expectation. Um, it wasn't uncommon for messiahs to, you know, what John the Baptist did out in the desert was not uncommon. People would go out into wilderness areas, and they would claim to be the messiah, and there would be insurrections against the Roman oppression. Um, so this is the context in which Jesus enters Jerusalem. And I do agree that uh, with Matt Rawls that Jesus uh, intentionally chooses symbols to indicate a messianic mission. And uh, that those would not have been missed. And the cry of the people, Hosanna, sometimes we, we picture the palms as a celebratory entrance. But in fact, Hosanna is save us. Uh, save us from the weight of what we're experiencing. Uh, save us from the presence of this Roman occupation. Uh, that's, that is the context in which Jesus enters. That's the cry of the people. And um, so how did Jesus understand himself? How did he really understand that entry? What, what, what came to my mind was to look to the Apostle Paul, who was writing uh, earlier than the Gospels were written. He was writing... Um, within decades of Jesus' death. And um, he, he writes very intentionally, Paul, someone who knew Peter, knew James personally, had, had, was around people who were with Jesus. And Paul writes of a citizenship in heaven, very deliberately. Writes of uh, Jesus as king, very deliberately. And, and Paul is a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. He, through his experience of the resurrected Christ and through his conversations with Peter and James, um, was very clear that what Jesus was doing was setting up an alternative kingdom. And the, the Gospels also, the kingdom of heaven has come near, the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus was very intentional in his entry into Jerusalem and, and very intentional in his sense of his messianic mission that he was establishing a new kingdom, a new order. Um, and that, I believe, is on his mind as he enters Jerusalem uh, for the Passover. Now, Matt uh, points out that this was a nonviolent movement. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I do agree. I, I, there is a, there's some biblical scholarship out there. Um, Judas Iscariot, uh, uh, that's very close to Sicarii, uh, uh, which is uh, a group of zealots, religious zealots. As I mentioned, this was a, 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 a period where groups were popping up all the time and, and trying different ways to, to get the Romans out. And zealots were um, militant. They, they, they took up arms in their efforts. And there's a, a, a stream of biblical scholarship suggesting that, that perhaps Judas was frustrated with Jesus, that he would not use his um, position to take up arms, that he was not a messiah who saw himself as a militant messiah. And that, in fact, Judas betrayed him on the grounds of his... Uh, frustration at Jesus' lack of militancy. Um, I, I think that 
Jesus, you know, over and over again, you know, put away your swords. Um, sometimes that people will use the temple as an example of Jesus being a militant leader, but I mean... When you're over through the table. Yeah, that's really the, the go-to um, in trying to make a case for Jesus being angry or... Uh, I think that that was a prophetic, symbolic act of what needed to be overturned uh, of the religious, political um, uh, uh, structure that Jesus was turning over, turning over the tables, turning over the 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 the, the wealth um, being accumulated based on people's um, religious exploitation. Um, but Jesus, Jesus, Jesus was the leader of a, a, a messianic movement that did not see itself as militant. I find it interesting. I think it's in John where. Uh, Peter pull, draws a sword and cuts off the ear of a, of a Roman soldier. Um, first of all, what's a fisherman doing with a sword? And especially what's he doing with a sword in the presence of Pilate? Mm -hmm. you know? But is that, is that account there for a purpose to show the nonviolence? You know, for Jesus to be able to say, put away your sword. Yeah, I think the it, so in the Garden of Gethsemane when they come to take Jesus, um, you know, there's a sword drawn and an ear cut off. I think in the count that's in my mind, it's a servant's ear. Um, yes, I think that that was a, a, a moment where we we see clearly Jesus's um, nonviolent approach to his messiahship. It's also a moment where we see. The fishermen, they, they were rough, you know, they weren't, they, they were rough guys. They were, they, the people Jesus hung out with weren't necessarily um, clean cut. And, um, but I, I think it's also, I think your question is interesting. Why is this fisherman carrying a sword? Um, why are these, these, I think um, there is a sense of heightened um, tension and a question of how do we, get free and um, in that context Jesus is very uh, very clear in my mind is it right to think of Jesus as leading a type of uprising or insurrection I think it is I think the question is who who does Jesus see himself leading an uprising against and that that's the key question. And I think that if you look into, for instance, the Gospel of Mark, I was just listening to a sermon by Tom Long, who's one of my favorite preachers. Uh, he wrote a book called The Witness of Preaching that's influenced a lot of us as preachers. And Tom Long preached a sermon on the Gospel of Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, um, Jesus sees himself as entering into the world uh, controlled by, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, Satan uh, going in and tying up the strong man so that uh, you don't, if you enter a house, how, how do you uh, uh, essentially create an uprising in the house? You bind the strong man, is what the Gospel of Mark says. And then you can begin to free people. And so in the Gospel of Mark specifically, I'll use that as, as my basis for the, for the response. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is clearly leading an uprising against the forces that oppress people. And he doesn't, uh, the, the Gospel, anytime, what Tom Long says is anytime you, you see um, Jesus interacting and healing or delivering, it is uh, within that larger context of, of binding the strong man and, and freeing people. Um, it, it, it is... Uh, uh, a very focused uprising against the forces that would uh, keep people bound, in, whether a um, woman with an issue of blood or uh, 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 someone who's deaf and can't speak, um, uh, as well as the temple system uh, where um, uh, a widow will give her last uh, coin. Um, and and, and um, this is the context in which Jesus is, is, is freeing people, is freeing people from, from the power 
that would keep them from being free. But is it an armed insurrection against the Roman emperor? Jesus is very deliberate in who is targeted, and, and yet he's still perceived as a threat by the Roman occupation because in the end he's crucified, which was the, uh, the form of Roman. Um, this was their way, it was their capital punishment. It was their way of keeping insurrection at bay. During his conversations with Pilate, what did Jesus say about his representing a worldly government? Yeah, so I, 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 I think what's referenced here is John's Gospel. And um, in John's Gospel, it's very essential to John to see Jesus as coming from above. Um, you read the first chapter of John's Gospel, um, the Word was made flesh. And so in, in, in his interaction with Pilate in John's Gospel, Jesus is representing this, um, he is the Word come into the world. He is uh, uh, representing the, 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 the heavenly um, kingdom. Um, my authority is not of this world, it is this conversation with Pilate. Um, and so Jesus in John's Gospel is, uh, uh, is the word of God entered into the flesh, entered into this world, uh, and has authority from above. And so it is a different kind of authority uh, from what Pilate occupies in his seat uh, as a representative of the Roman government. How do we as Christians address situations such as poverty or oppression that require change. I, I do believe there's no room for violence. Uh, I so the cornerstone of our faith is Jesus Christ. You know, the stone that was rejected. The cornerstone of the biblical narrative that Jesus was familiar with is the story of the Exodus. This is the cornerstone of the Bible. It is the reference point. Uh, and the Exodus is the story of how God interacts with Pharaoh. Pharaoh tries to set himself up as a god. And God, um, to free people, um, ha goes head to head with Pharaoh. Uh, the old phrase, your, hand, your arms aren't long enough to box with God. That, this is the story of Pharaoh. And, uh, and God frees God's people in the Exodus. Uh, this, this is the cornerstone of the Bible. It's the cornerstone uh, of how we interpret the Bible. And Jesus references the Exodus in Luke's Gospel. Jesus says, I've come to Jerusalem to carry out an Exodus. This is, these are Jesus' words. He's directly referencing this story. He's come to free people. And so I think that um, in addressing situations of poverty or, or oppression that require change, we have to recognize Jesus' purpose in the world. We have to recognize the cornerstone of our biblical faith, uh, that, that Christ, referencing the Exodus, is saying, I've come to set people free. And there's no room in our um, faith practice for oppression of any kind. Um, the other thing that I wanted to reference here is that in Matthew's gospel, Matthew is the only gospel that references the ecclesia, the church. It's the only gospel that makes direct, re direct reference to the church. And Matthew's understanding of the church is as something different from the, the society that surrounds it. He really um, emphasizes this is a new family. Uh, who are my mothers and my brothers uh, and my, my siblings? Uh, these are, these who are gathered in the ecclesia, these in the church are my new family. And that would have been radical for Rome because Rome ordered society according to a specific understanding of family. It would have been radical in um, Jewish faith because family was such an essential part passed on through the generations. And now Christ is saying, no, this is a new family. This is, this, this is something different from the society that surrounds you. 
And so um, the church, all this imagery of the church, uh, the people of God, the ecclesia is meant to be a light on the hill, meant to be salt of the earth. Uh, uh, Jesus has a, an understanding that, that this church will do something different from the society around it and will treat people in a way that the light shines, not a bushel basket over it, but that the light shines uh, for all the world to see. And so uh, that, that, those are my two thoughts, uh, are, are that we need to understand Jesus as he understood himself in relation to freedom, and we need to understand the church in continuity with Christ as the, the source of continued freedom and alleviation of oppression. Um, that, that, that is faithful to the gospel and, and, and based on the gospels to Jesus' understanding of his messianic purpose. All right, who in our time has offered an example of nonviolence in response to oppression and poverty? Yeah, so, uh, so of course, uh, when Dad and I were talking, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. came to mind and um, as an example in our country. And, and I, I, I thought of a story. I, I, um, I was interested in the civil rights movement um, as I learned more. And I, we have a friend, close friend of the family, uh, who grew up in the youth group, Phil Hodges, who lives in Birmingham, Alabama. And one, one of my visits with Phil, um, I had opportunity to go to the Civil Rights Museum. And I, I, I had opportunity to talk with the archivist there. And if you go down to the Civil Rights Museum, the archives are in the back. And what I was interested in was, why did people um, march through the park? I mean, this was, you know, the, the where you see the film of the dogs and the hoses. This was one of the, the real ground zeros of that. And I, I said, what made people march uh, in, during this time? What's the common thread? And, and because there were children, you know, uh, uh, young people, students, there were um, uh, steel workers, there were educators. What's the common thread among all these different people? And what the archivist said, he said is when you read the firsthand accounts from, from people who participated in the civil rights marches, um, the ones that started in churches, for instance, there was the church where the four girls were killed. Um, the accounts all emphasize the worship experience. And many of the people said that they didn't go with the intention to march. But they were so moved by the experience of the worship that they were compelled to march. And they're, they're actually first-hand accounts, because dad's dad's state trooper and my grandfather, they're first-hand accounts of state troopers who were in the church, meant to either keep people in or keep people out, however you want to look at it, who had their position on civil rights changed through their experience of this worship. And so... Um, I think that that is the kind of example of, um, of, of, of how worship and the Spirit and, and, the, and, and Jesus as our Messiah and um, our experience in church, how it begins to propel us into action to address oppression and um, uh, uh, issues of poverty. I think Martin Luther King... It was, a, was obviously a, a leader of the civil rights movement, but I think it's important to recognize how uh, just everyday people um, participate in that when we're moved um, to participate in that. Where do you think the grace lies in this final session of our journey through Lamez? Um... So a couple of, of thoughts uh, came to mind on this. Um, one is, uh, until, as we talk about the context, until we experience or have some compassion with or, or some uh, sense of the, the, the fee, what it feels like to be oppressed, what it feels like to... Um, to be limited from the full experience of, of freedom and liberty. Um, it's difficult to relate to the cross when we say that the cross of Christ brings freedom um, from sin and death. And 
freedom is not an abstract concept. I think sometimes when we just read the scripture out of context, it can seem like just an idea. Um, but this is real. And um, that scene in the movie, when we watch the Les Mis movie, where there's this shift at the barricades, and, and, and it's almost like a, a vision of people on the barricades experiencing this kind of freedom and liberation. And um, it, it's kind of presented as a, almost a heavenly vision of future hope. Um, maybe not unlike Victor Hugo's sense of hopefully the 20th century will be <laughs> better. better. <laughs> um, you know, that, that sense of expectation. Um, but I think for me, the connection between grace and freedom, um, we find grace in freedom. And that's foundational to our faith. It's foundational to our understanding of the cross. And um, once we've been st stuck, really stuck, really experienced what it is through illness or through um, uh, some kind of legal restriction or um, some kind of uh, relationship that has us bound. Until we really experience that and then experience God freeing us from that. That, that is the grace uh, of, of the barricades to me. Um, and what the, regardless of their reason for being there, what they were aspiring to. It, it, it's, it's often an aspiration. Um, the, the other thought that I had here um, is, is the idea of the friends. Um, uh, I mentioned Jesus, um, you know, who are my mother, my brother, sister, these are. Uh, there is this sense of community in this, this sense of um, being together in the midst of a difficult time um, that is a grace, I think. Um, even our ability to do this, you know, the two of us sitting in a room, you know, there, there is a grace in, in community, in, in church family, in family. Um, that we can come to appreciate um, more, more and more as we are forced to physically isolate. Um, we come to see what's really of value and what really is a gift. And I think that that's evident um, also in this period of, of, of the story. Um, uh, so freedom and friendship uh, are two themes of grace that I see. No surprise that I've wondered as I've as I've looked back on the, what happened at the barricade. You know, wondering what what was this for? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what you're suggesting, while there's no good reason for for senseless death, I think you're nonetheless suggesting something good that came out of it in terms of that sense of community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sense of and the and the aspiration of freedom. I think that. You know, there, there, there is this hope. I mean, we talk about the messianic hope. Um, Paul thought it was imminent. The, Victor Hugo thought it was imminent. There, there's a sense in which uh, the, 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 the freedom is right around the corner. Um, and, and, and we live in that hope. That, that is our faith. Um, you know, I was with somebody on a call this morning uh, who's running soup kitchens right now. And they're, they're, they're high-end chefs who run soup kitchens. And... He said on the call, when this is all over, we're going to host one of these really elaborate dinners for you all that we do normally. You know, now we're doing soup kitchens, but normally we do seven course meals. And, and when we get through this, we're going to have you all for a seven course meal. And, and, and the, somebody responded to him, you know, I don't know which I like better. You know, the idea that we're <laughs> through this or the idea of the seven course meal. But this is... This is our aspiration. We call it the messianic banquet. This is what we hope for. This is what we look for. And I think that um, as flawed as, and, and the loss of sense of loss of life, and who's against who, all of that, there is this hope present in that community of people. And we can't, we, we, we need that. In situations like this, we need that. We need that aspiration of a day to come. And um, that is foundational to the, our gospel.
That is the context of our gospel. That's what the hearers were hearing with Jesus. That's what the hearers who first heard the gospels heard. Um, there is a better day. It's on the horizon. There is a banquet coming. Um, and we can live together in that hope. Well, I for one am very um, glad that you were able to be here today. And I think everybody that, that uh, takes part in, in this session will agree. In my experience in the UK, uh, there is a blessing uh, simply referred to as the grace. And I think I've experienced this in both the Church of England and the Baptist Church there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if you could close this Lenten series by offering us the grace. Yeah, glad to. And, and grateful to you, Dad, for organizing this. And um, I think it's been really rich. I've really been moved by it. I think our whole family has. I trust that others have too. Um, so thank you for all your efforts uh, in putting it together. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.